Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Friday's plenary session. Uh, my name is Derek Vance, and I, with uh, Helen Williams, have co-chaired the Science and Organization Committees for this uh, Goldsmith Conference. So we had still have plenty of really good talks this afternoon, so we're not done yet. Um, in fact, uh, one of those talks is by my co-chair at four o'clock, that was a remarkable act of self-denial to do that for herself. Um, but this is the last time that we will have a lot of you in one room, so it gives me the opportunity to say some thank yous to people who really helped with the organization of this 29th uh, Goldschmidt. So the first uh, people to say thank you to is you guys. Uh, you know, Goldschmidt is very much a community-run conference. Uh, we have uh, 4,087 delegates at, at the 29th Goldschmidt here in Barcelona. And we thank you all for coming. We thank you for buying in. We thank you for making this, having made this an exciting and socially interesting and friendly conference. And I hope you've all had a good time. Have you all had a good time? I really thought I'd have to do that twice. That was very impressive. Okay, so here's some, just some statistics. Uh, I won't go, th go through all of these. Uh, some of them are fairly standard, but this year I just want to highlight the fact that we had, 400, we had a, a new format, Flash Talks. We had 479 of those where people were given five minutes to give a snappy presentation about their poster as, a, as a, an appetite wetter. Of course, we've had uh, four so far, and I'm sure a fifth in a minute, excellent plenary speakers. Uh, and then we've had a lot of the traditional things that Goldschmidt do now that have worked very well again this year. We've had more pre-conference workshops than we've ever had before. We've had the lunchtime events for early career scientists. We've had the mentor-mentee pair-ups, and we've had uh, field trips. Okay, so... The first set of people I have to say thank you to are the other members that Helen and I both have to say thank you to are the other members of the Science Committee and the Organizing Committee. They are the people who really built the base of the, of the science program. But as I've said already, Goldschmidt is a community effort, and so there are many more people in the audience here who have, who have been involved in making the science program a success. Uh, the theme chairs, the, uh, the people who suggested sessions and chaired those sessions, the uh, people who ran the lunchtime events, the people who organized the pre-conference workshop. So that's the science bit of these thank yous. Of course, the thing that maybe is less noticeable uh, to all of you is how well the conference runs. Goldschmidt has run well again. And there are some people I need to thank for, th for that aspect of the conference. So really the main one, the rock, actually, on which the European Association of Geochemistry is built is Mariod Hulsoff. Now, she is the Chief Operating Officer of, uh, is that your title? Of, of, of EAG. And she is the foundation, ably assisted, of course, by Alice Williams, of everything, or almost everything good that uh, EAG does. And I want to say a special thank you to Mariod. And Mario, no one, you, you, you maybe don't get as much exposure as you should. Can you just stand up and, and take a bow? Mario Holzer. <clears throat> so the other side of that logistical equation are our professional conference organizers also put a massive amount of work into this conference. Of course, White Iron Conferences, uh, led by Jackie here, the other members of her team. And this time, for the first time, a, a new uh, team, uh, Congregs, who look after a slightly different aspect of, of, of those logistics. Thank you to them. You've seen the blue t-shirted student helpers all around uh, being enthusiastic and uh, energetic and helpful all week. And uh, they've been also been fantastic. Can we say thank you to them as well? Yeah. 
uh, I don't know whether you, you, you know this exists, but we have five uh, EAG bloggers. There are some really very interesting blogs uh, that you can go and read about the bells of Goldschmidt. There's a Goldschmidt survival essential, and you can find those on the uh, EAG website. Thank you, bloggers. I want to say thank you to all the exhibitors. Uh, uh, we've uh, got a, uh, a larger number than usual this year again, and so we're very, we're very happy for their support here at Goldschmidt. Uh, maybe you also don't know about this. Uh, uh, we've we've uh, had seven, I think, press releases this week. That's all been coordinated by Tom Parkhill. I don't know whether he's in the audience. He's been very uh, proactive and energetic. Uh, we've been in all kinds of excellent news media as well as maybe some less, well, more dubious <laughs> media uh, that are listed uh, on this slide here. Yeah, so thank you to Tom, and we've had a small team of uh, reviewers. Now, there's one thing that Mariod warned me to say that I've forgotten to say, so I'll do it now. We have a childcare uh, organization here, Noah's Ark Childcare. They've been excellent. Someone said to me today they've really set the bar high for future uh, childcare at Goldsmith. So thank you to them. And, okay. Yep. <coughs> And then finally, of course, this wonderful conference center we're in, and all the staff is so, oh, Noah's Ark Child Care is there, okay. Um, and all, all, all the staff associated with it, I think it's been fantastic this week. It's uh, run like clockwork, and it's no small thanks to them as well. So now, I am going to ask Ken Rubin to come up and whet your appetite for next year's Goldsmith in uh, Honolulu. And um, I hope to welcome all of you to the uh, next Goldschmidt Conference 2020, which will be in Honolulu, Hawaii, on the island of Oahu. Um, before I do that, I just want to say one more thank you to the conveners of this year's Goldschmidt. It's been a truly excellent conference, and we hope to, to learn from it and build off of it. And um, we're trying to get 5,000 people to the Honolulu Conference. So, um, Please do come. The conference website is already up and available, and I encourage you to take a look. You can see the URL down there on the bottom. Uh, this is a picture um, from the island of Oahu, one of our many famous beaches called Waimanalo. This is the conference center. You can see it's right downtown. Uh, those are the buildings of Waikiki. It's that uh, building in the center of the upper image. Diamond Head is off in the distance. We'll be holding the pre-meeting workshops and um, hopefully some of the housing uh, for um, students at the University of Hawaii Manoa, which is the main campus. It's about a kilometer and a half or so away from this, off to the left of that image. The uh, science themes are already up and available. They're fairly similar to what you see this year, a little bit of um, differences around the edges, trying to emphasize uh, a few slightly different things. We encourage you all to start thinking about science themes uh, and sessions that fit within these themes. The uh, applications for sessions will open at the beginning of next month, the beginning of September, and close in the middle of October. And we ask you to please not wait to the last minute to propose your sessions and workshops. In addition to all the excellent themes that we've come to know and love from uh, Goldschmidt, we're gonna try something a little bit different next year on top of that to try and add some value to the program, which is in essence to try and highlight talks that emphasize some of the ways in which Hawaii and the Pacific region have been instrumental in our understanding of fundamental processes in geochemistry. You can see I've listed some of them there, things like the atmospheric CO2 curve at Mauna Loa, our understanding of hotspots in mantle geochemistry, 
ocean time series, etc. We also have a very science-engaged populace in the islands, and we hope to do extensive media outreach into the community by highlighting things that are happening at the uh, conference that are associated with things that, that people are interested in in the region, things like sea level change and climate change and volcanism and coral reef ecology, et cetera. So as you're preparing you know, your, either your session proposals or you start to think about um, when it's time to start submitting talks, think about how you might emphasize some of those things and, and we'll be sure to highlight your presentation. So just like every Goldschmidt, we've got an extensive menu of uh, early career and social events, largely patterned off of what you've seen uh, this year. What we find being in Hawaii, the sort of last populated time zone on the planet, is that many of the visitors arrive and they're sort of up at 3 a.m. with nothing to do. So we've um, set up some morning events, um, probably some yoga on the beach, uh, bring your mat if you want to, uh, 5K runs. Um, the ocean is very pleasant at sunrise. Uh, finally, we have some field trips planned. Um, Hawaii has an amazing physiographic features. You can see geology in action. So we have a couple of field trips planned on the island of Oahu. These are one-day events to the two volcanoes that make up the island. We also have field trips planned to Maui, as well as a couple field trips planned to the Big Island. Those will be multi-day field trips. For the Big Island, one of them focuses on soils, one of them focuses on volcanic features. Um, we'll just have to see Kilauea Volcano's in, uh, been in its first hiatus in uh, more than three decades. We don't know if it's going to come back alive or not, but uh, we're trying to get that arranged for y'all. Okay, so these are the dates, the important dates, um, and probably the key one to note is if you're planning to propose a workshop or a session, um, those proposals are due by mid-October. Please don't wait to the last minute. Abstract submissions will open in the middle of December and close in February, and then you know, uh, signing up for the meeting will happen in the spring. So finally, I just want to leave you with a video that was produced by the Hawaii Tourism Authority. It's meant to entice you all um, to come to the conference. If you like it, then I will be happy. If you don't, um, don't blame me, I didn't make it.
Thank you for your attention. I'm, I know you're all anxious to hear Chris's talk, uh, but first we're going to have a few comments from Dan Frost. Wow. Uh, thanks. Uh. <laughs> as uh, as co-chair of the uh, 2021 uh, Goldschmidt, it uh, comes to me to make a, a short advert for uh, for the Leon meeting. So after what's clearly going to be a, a really amazing meeting in Hawaii, Goldschmidt the following year will return to the very heart of Europe, to the wonderful city of of, of Leon in France. So Leon is. Uh, very nicely placed with some fantastic locations nearby. It's very quick to get to the Alps, to see the geology of the Massif Central, and even to travel to the French Riviera is, uh, is also very close. And Lyon is, of course, uh, very well known for its world class cuisine, which has been described by people who know as perhaps probably some of the best cuisine in the world. It's also, uh, on the other hand, a very affordable city, so the uh, hotels are very reasonably priced. And uh, what I think is also great is that the city of Lyon will provide public transport within the city for the delegates of, of the conference. So Lyon is also very well connected, so it has a big international airport. There's uh, also very good connections for European cities by train. So with the very fast French trains that they have, it's only two hours to Lyon from Paris. It's six hours from Frankfurt. And at least at the moment, it's five hours from London. And if you, um, <laughs> if you look at the uh, fantastic city of Lyon with 2,000 years of history, it's built on the confluence between two very large rivers. So if you were very ecologically minded, you could, of course, come to Lyon by boat. Ah, yeah, I should, uh, I should just pass the map there to, uh, to show you actually uh, where it is. So yeah, we, uh, we look forward to, oh yes, most important point is that uh, in 2021, so in two years time, the Goldschmidt in Lyon will be held approximately just, just over a month earlier than it normally is, so on the 4th to the 9th of July, and that's very important for you all to remember, so I look forward to seeing you all there, and uh, thanks very much for your attention. And now I hand back to uh, Derek Vance for, to introduce the speakers. Okay. What? Ah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So uh, uh, my, uh, I'm, I now have to introduce the, today's plenary speaker. Before I do that, just a reminder that on the conference website, there will be a link to YouTube videos of all the plenaries, singing pop-up talks, apparently, and some other, and some photos that will come eventually as well. Okay, so I'm very happy and very pleased to introduce uh, Chris Hawksworth, Professor Chris Hawksworth from the University of Bristol to give uh, today's plenary. But actually introducing Chris in a sentence or two and his work in geochemistry is not so easy because uh, his work has ranged all over geochemistry. I guess he started in uh, metamorphic geochronology many, many years ago. And, um, uh, but he's worked in areas as diverse as uh, isotopic tracers of archaeological artifacts, mostly in Ireland. And, uh, and he's dabbled in sort of isotopes in uh, uh, medicine and animal physiology. Um, but I guess he's best known for a topic quite close to what he's talking today. He has uh, worked for many years on understanding the rates and mechanisms and the timing of the growth and stabilization of the continental lith lithosphere and it, the changes in its, co its chemical composition through time using isotopic and, and other tools. You would say that was a fair statement. And um, I think that's what we're probably going to hear something about today, because his title, of course, one of those tectonic mechanisms is plate tectonics, and this is his title today. Chris. Thank you. 
Thank you, Derek. Thank you very much. Is the mic on? It is. Thank you, Derek, and thank you all for being here. But as Derek says, this is the last time we're all together. And the, one, the two people we ought to put our hands together for are Derek and Helen Williams. Because it's all very well having a big team, but the buck stops somewhere. It stops with them, and it's been a great week. Earlier this week, uh, Roberta Rudnick um, introduced us to the importance of understanding the composition of the continental crust and how that may have changed with time. Now, what I want to do is to look, look and see to what extent the continental crust is a useful archive for what the tectonic regimes looked like back in time, and in particular, what the ways in which it informs discussion of the onset of plate tectonics. The, the debate has gone on a long time. There are an awful lot of... Um, how do I get back? Go back, thank you. Thank you very much, but that doesn't work at all. But is that not the laser? Well, that's what I pushed, yeah. Okay, success, thank you. Th this um, stratigraphic column, if you like, on the right, has all these ticks along the side of it, which are various people's estimates for when plate tectonics started. In some ways, perhaps that's daunting, but on the other side, a lot of that is about definition, a lot of it's about language, a lot of it is about what did we mean by plate tectonics when we made those statements. Is it the same as it is today, or was it different in the past? So let me try and persuade you that a lot of this discussion is about definition, and maybe we can tighten up what we think the onset of plate tectonics might be. This is a, a view of the Pilbara. And one of the key issues is clearly that the rock record is biased. We can have debates about what way is it biased. It's biased by having very little old rock. Maybe biased by having supercontinents that preserve some kinds of rock more than others. But whatever the details of it, I think we can agree the rock, ra the rec the rock record is biased. And we have to find ways to see through those biases to get at processes. The issue then is twofold. If we think about plate tectonics, obviously a lot of the key aspects of it are the asymmetry of plate boundaries, the fact that you might have paired metamorphic belts, the fact that you will have compressional tectonics moving one lot of rock over another, and how these will leave you with their different field relations. But the other is this issue of scale. It's great to go to the Pilbara and do a detailed case study and say it was vertical tectonics followed by subduction. But how, as geologists, are we meant to put that into some global framework? It seems to me that geology has this weakness that we don't move well from scale to scale in a way that physics does and other subjects do. So there's a big and interesting issue about how I put in a global context my detailed case study of Issua, of the Pilbara, of whatever it might be. And how can we address that? One way is to say there must be other sites, we'll go and look for them, which of course is no longer sustainable. The second thing people do is go for global data sets, which you hope are representative, but they're global data sets of samples from some biased record. So you're optimistic, but you're not entirely sure. And the third thing people do, and in a way people looking at life and the interaction of the biosphere and the shallow level parts of the Earth do this automatically, is to think not only when is there first evidence for something, plate tectonics, but when does it have a significant effect that you can measure? So you can sp make a lot of progress by looking for the consequences of the thing you've just started, rather than finding another outcrop where that thing is well exposed. So three things. You have better outcrops, you have global data sets, which may be biased, and you have this notion about how we get at the consequences of what you think started, and how can we take those forward. And here's one example. 
Subduction used to be taken as, if you showed subduction happened, it made plate tectonics had started. So that leapt over this scale issue in a way that was perhaps slightly uneasy. But we now know there are good examples that you can trigger subduction by impacts, you can trigger subduction by plumes. So just the finding of a subduction sequence is really no longer some smoking gun. And we need to put this into a global scale and see how we can take that forward. The other issue is, we were always brought up, I think, to say that history was written by the victors. Just perhaps our geological record is written by the mountains. And it happens in a couple of ways, all right? It happens, partly there are these wonderful mountains we can go and study, and they're well-preserved in high-level rocks, and we can see how they formed, and the Alps are as spectacular today as they have been for a long time. And then they get eroded. So this is the eroded Damara mountain belt in Namibia, in the, in the, in the Damara, the Pan-African belt. This is a tertiary erosion surface. These are granulite facies rocks and in situ melting at the surface of the Earth. But because it was a mountain, it left us with a regional fabric of compression re relating in some way to some old plate margin, which is the kind of thing we could be looking for if we're looking for uh, plate tectonics to be active. So in a sort of initial summary of what we can look for, this then is just to highlight there are lots of wonderful geodynamic models out there. And um, increasingly, the great plus about them is that they're throwing tests back at the geologists about what we could, fi what we could find excuse me, that would allow us to take this forward. We've talked about subduction, recognizing subduction doesn't necessarily mean plate tectonics. There is also a change of scale issue. The other thing you might get from the geological record is a sense of when plates, when crust became rigid enough that you would like to call it a plate. We can look for lateral movement and compressional tectonics as we see in mountain belts and in plate margins. And we could look for consequences of having started plate tectonics and for it becoming a dominant process, in which case things like rates of growth and others we could look at might become important. So here's an outline. And it's an outline, some of you have seen this slide before, but it's an outline against these granulite facies in situ melts in the core of this Pan-African belt. Probably what's happening under the Alps today, the optimists would say, but that may be all you're left with when the Alps is eroded. And we can look at regional studies to see what we can learn. We can look at tectonic style, metamorphism, and geochemistry. We can change scales. We can think, how can we go to more global scales and look at composition of new continental crust and the rates of growth? And then we'll try and put together some of the changes that happened around three billion years or in the late Archean to see how they add, add up and what they may tell us. That will lead us into maybe a timing of when plate tectonics became dominant as a process. And then if we have time, we might link into molecular clocks and see, are we beginning to get to a stage where we can link what we understand from the geology and the timing of events in geology to link back into the other timescales of molecular clocks as they develop? This is my Brexit slide. Homes in Ireland, for those of you who don't know me. It's nice, maybe, in a time of Brexit to go back to a language, in this case from 1951, of southern Rhodesia and the remarkably low grade of metamorphism of Archean rocks in the colony. The, but this is McGregor's presidential address to the Geological Society of Southern Africa in 1951. And in a way, it was a map that we certainly saw as students, which highlighted this dome and basin structure of Zimbabwe. And it highlighted this low grade and these, the texture I've just said of gregarious batholiths between which the schists, the schists have a synclinal structure. So this is taken increasingly, obviously, as evidence for vertical tectonics rather than uh, lateral compressional tectonics, and it's one of the first places or first examples of when that came to be discussed. If we look at a little more detail, as in Western Australia, and develop that theme, 
Here's the map you're all very familiar with of the Pilbara with the same satellite version of that dome and basin structure, pre 3.1 billion years. You go to the Yilgarn, 2.9, in the late Archean or so, you start to get these much more linear belts consistent with horizontal tectonics and presumably the sideward movement of material you might want to link to some kind of plate tectonics. And then the other thing that was a real shock to us is to think about the oldest dike swarms you know. And in this case, what happened in Australia was that at 2.4, after all this had happened, the crust and the lithosphere were rigid enough to have this spectacular dike swarm. And as we'll see, it seems, unless you can correct me, that there are effectively no well-developed dy big dike swarms before about 2.7 billion years ago. So what does that tell us about the physics of the crust and the lithosphere? Is it a sign of material getting rigid enough that you too might want to call it a plate? Metamorphism, just in one aspect. Mike Brown's talked a lot about how we can use the paired metamorphic belt uh, analogy in the Archean, where there are at times of increasing bimodality of metamorphism. But I want to use it here just more specifically one of the issues about dome and basin structures, here's a map of the Pilbara, dome and basin, we think vertical tectonics. If you go to the Alps, because it was thicker, sorry, because it was thickened, then vertical movements took place, and domes and basins may well form by the time it's all eroded. So you can get domes and basins in principle from thickening and the consequent vertical movement of material, but the difference, of course, is that these are relatively high grade and these are low grade. And that's just summarized here on the top. So this is depth going down in kilometers, as geologists used to think about it. This is temperature. Here's the sort of feel for Barbert and Pilbara, which varies a lot in temperature, depending on how near some magmatic body you are, but doesn't vary much in the way of going to high pressures. And clearly, this field is different from the collision zone P's and T's that you get from the Caledonides, the Damra, the Himalayas, and the Swiss Alps. So these may well give you domal structures at the end, but they will be high grade. Geochemistry. This is a summary of thorium niobium ratio against age for a number of examples of people who've looked at Archean suites of rocks and concluded that they're either subduction or intraplate related. Now, I'm using thorium niobium not because I think it's robust and you should all use it, just because it illustrates what those studies concluded. All right? And the ones that are in the green field in the top half, basically with high thorium niobium, are studies that concluded these might well have a subduction component because this ratio is high, like in arcs. And the ones in the red field are those who concluded there was no sign of a subduction component, and they're sort of intraplatish, if you can use that language back then. There are a couple of things that are significant. One is you can never, I don't think, get down into the red field by contamination. So that seems quite a robust signal. But you can obviously get up into the green field by contamination, and some people might wish to do that. But the red field seems relatively unambiguous. But the much more exciting thing to me is that these appear to link to different tectonic styles. The areas that we can see, and there's enough terrain from Zimbabwe to the Barberton to the early Pilbara, these intraplate rocks are all associated with this kind of tectonics. This is cheating. This is a slide of the, of the late Archean in the Eastern Superior. It's where these rocks come from. But obviously, this fabric is much later, so it doesn't relate to what the fabric might have been when those rocks were formed. But by the time you get to the Yilgarn or the late stage of the Pilbara, you're starting to get regional deformation fabrics, as you would get in compression zones, that you could say might link to plate margins and be associated with the subduction suggested by the geochemistry. So and the real take-home message to me is that it's very encouraging that the geochemical signals link to tectonic signals where we can see, where we can establish that in the field. 
So just to bring all that together, and this is a slide Peter Kayward put together for Royal Society meeting uh, a year ago. This highlights, this is age, 2.4 down to 3.2 billion years, but different provinces, Superior, uh, India, China, Pilbara, Yilgarn, Zimbabwe. The old rocks, the green, are just TTGs everyone's very familiar with, Sanukatoids, so going up into what to loosely call potassic granites, which are often regarded as late stage in the stabilization of different lithospheres. And if you're brave enough to put tectonics on here too, this symbol is for vertical tectonics seen in some areas before more compressional tectonics at the end, and some areas it's clearly not identified or hard to see as in Zimbabwe. And the first point again is that these all happen at different times in different places. So a little bit like that subduction slide, all right, the, 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 con the conclusion would seem to be that subduction was taking place in different places at different times, at least locally, even though intraplate rocks were being generated elsewhere. And here this highlights that the shift from TTG into the end stabilization of the lithosphere again happens at very different times in different places. And then we come to the point I made earlier. The oldest dike swarms in these different terrains are all 2.5, 2.6 and younger. So this seems to be a more uniform expression. And it is a question again about what do those um, striking big dike swarms mean? There were clearly volcanics beforehand. Why were there not big dike swarms? Is that a measure of the rigidity of the crust and what might we do with it? So if we summarize what the, sort of the regional studies have showed us, we have uh, areas of domes and vertical tectonics. We have other areas of more planar fabrics. Superior would be a good example. Um, and become much more dominant by the late Archean. We've seen that geologically, lithosphere stabilization, if you can do that from TTG into potassic rocks and the stabilization of cratons, is diachronous over 600 mi million years. And we've noted that subduction, as far as we can tell, did occur at different times in different places, but that doesn't make it a global self-sustaining um, system of dominantly by plate tectonics. It just shows there are good examples where subduction took place. And we need to find a way to upscale those kind of observations. So what then can we do to move to another scale? And this then moves us into looking at global databases, which may be biased, all right, it's hard to tell, um, but at the moment that's a commonly used approach. And this one with uh, Bruno Dream, we tried to use Rubidium and RBSR and SMND and the associated isotopes to estimate what juvenile cross compositions might be. Some of you have seen this before. This is the eroded granites and gneisses of the Damara Pan-African belt with the, what I would call loosely the molasse sediments on top of it, which is where this mobile belt is now eroded to. And while most on this crustal section then, most of these rocks that we see regularly, the, the sediments and the schists and the low grade and the granites, all these upper crusts are what we commonly see when we go in the field. What we're trying to get to is what's the composition of their sources or the material that came from the mantle from which they were then derived. And this is what was published a few years ago. So th this is a plot of the rubidium strontium ratio of the source, all right, of up to 13,000 volcanic and plutonic rocks. So you have 13,000 volcanic and plutonic rocks, which were derived by melting crustal rocks. So you have a crystallization age, and you have a model age. And the RBSR ratio plotted is the RBSR between the model age, taken to be the new crust, and the time of crystallization when you form the magma that was analyzed. If you want to do it in diagrammatically, there's strontium, isotopes against time, mantle evolving here, model age here, crystallization age here, what's the RBSR between them? Sorry, there and there and there and there. And what's striking is this RBSR ratio 
of what we might call new crust, because it's the stuff from which the upper crustal material was derived. It's very noisy in the Archean, which is why there's a big drive to look at appetites and other things we've heard about this week. But the mean is around 0 0.03, all right? Not dissimilar to what you see in greenstone belts, and if you believe correlations with RBSR and silica, these values would be silica contents of, I don't know, 48%. So those are good greenstone belt rocks. And at those kind of RBSR ratios, you're not depleting the upper mantle in, for in RBSR for strontium, right? That RBSR ratio is similar to the upper mantle. And then at about three billion years ago, this is model age down the bottom, then there is a gradual increase in the RBSR ratio of the new crustal material from which the upper crustal rocks were derived. And it's this shift from mafic to more intermediate compositions that is the new continental crust, which is what's intrigued us about whether that is beginning to be a global signal uh, for a change in tectonic regime to getting, moving away from bimodal silica Green, uh, greenstone TTG, granite suites here, to more subduction-related suites here. And you can take that one step further, and you can look at recent data from Central and South America, and that it seems to be a perfectly plausible variation with RBSR and crustal thickness. The thicker the crust, the more differentiated magmas are to get through, the higher the RBSR ratio. And if you take this as a calibration curve and apply it to the data we've just seen, your RBSR ratio for the new crust then morphs into this crustal thickness variation from 20 kilometers or so at about 3 billion years up to 40 kilometers or so by the mid-Proterozoic. That's a big leap of faith that's hard to test. But it is very consistent with strontium isotope ratios going up, with developing more intermediate composition crusts, more crusts being seen above sea level, and a change in tectonic regime, which we would say was the onset of plate tectonics becoming much more dominant. And then there are zircons. There's been many, many, many discussions of zircons this week, and they're a hugely invaluable timepiece. I mean, they are, they are the reason that we calibrate deep geological time. There are now hundreds of thousands of analyses this is a compilation from uh, Roberts and Spencer way years ago now. And this is simply plotting uh, half new isotope ratios against the age of zircons from 4,000 million years through to the present day. There are clusters of times with lots of zircon and times with not much zircon. So there are peaks and troughs in the zircon distribution pattern. And different people interpret those differently. It matters not to this debate of today, but it's just worth highlighting that they are interpreted differently. And some groups, like ourselves, are impressed that these peaks of ages match up with when we think supercontinents developed. And that they, these supercontinents and these times of lots of collision were a way of retaining more material in the crust that you would otherwise do if you were just subducting it. And that those supercontinents have therefore biased the zircon record by retaining uh, lots of zircons of the ages of collisions and supercontinents. The alternative interpretation is that those pulses of lots of zircons linked to increased magma volumes, perhaps due to some global thermal turnover. And, and I think the truth of it is, people go down these different routes slightly on geologic judgment. They're quite hard to test really rigorously. But as soon as you start down one road, you're not coming back, right? And the chances of having gone down different roads and finding tests to come back on are quite tricky. But it matters not for today, because the, what we're wanting to get out of the zircons today is developing uh, systems for uh, some sense of getting rates of crustal growth. And then these are the kind of diagrams people have been using. So this is the volume of the continental crust up to 100% of the present day, plotted against age from 4 billion years to zero. The neodymium model ages is the green curve from Condi and Astor. And that is a compilation of all the neodymium model ages in diff different parts of the world, excuse me, and how the proportions of rocks with model ages of 2.5 compared with the proportions of 1 billion years. And you have this 
record of what's preserved today um, in the geological record. It's always seemed to me extremely unlikely, right, that the balance of Archean and Phanerozoic rocks or whatever in what's preserved today would relate well to what was there in the Archean and what volumes were generated. So there was then pressure by lots of groups to try and develop models for crustal growth that were not tied particularly closely to the rock record of the present day and what's preserved. And the ones shown here are uh, one from uh, Pujol et al, which is an argon um, atmosphere argument from data produced in the Arche from Archean material, and a number of models from Dwee et al. The way those models work, all right, because you've got lots of zircon data, you can do the proportion of new and old crusts for every zircon, but you've got to get to volume. And these these curves get to volume by starting at the present day with 100% crust. And simply the models work, and Belusova and others did this in the beginning, so to speak, is to work back in time and for every time slice, take the proportion of new crust and rework crust back through time and plot from anchored on this point your curve of how the crust grew with time from wherever you want to start it through to the present day. There are models. But there's a number of different approaches using trace elements, using argon, using needle in shales, and using zircons that sort of get you roughly to the similar position. And the point is mostly that if you get to curves that have, I don't know, 70%, 75% of the present volume of the crust already present at 3 billion, then you have a change in slope somewhere in that area. So somewhere here, you're going to go from a steep slope to a, a flat slope. This may well not be sharp, this may be very gradual, and it's hard to tie down how gradual it is. But the reduction all right, of the rate of crustal growth, we have taken not to be a reduction in the rate at which new crust is generated from the Earth, but, a, but an increase in the rate at which crust is destroyed, because crust is destroyed readily when you get plate tectonics going as the dominant scheme. So if there's ever something near a smoking gun for us, it's when the rate of crustal growth started to flatten off. This may not be well resolved, but somewhere through here in the late Archean. You'll give up. <laughs> right, and just to show you how that's been modeled, just to uh, uh, Digress briefly in a way. This is a model from Dwee et al. in the Royal Society volume in 2018. And this is simply to say if on the previous slide you had these uh, curves for crustal growth and you had the present day record of Neodymium model age through time in the different proportions, how would you get from one to the other? Lots of crust is missing today that was generated if 70% was already here. And this, uh, this um, plot simply highlights this very simple box model from 4.5 through to the present day, where the crust generation rate, as I've just said, doesn't vary very much. Instead, you can change the crust destruction rate, and you're trying to hit net growth rates, which we've just seen from the change, as inferred from the zircon record. What's interesting is that this model says that if you want to move from 70% crust to 20 or 30% at, at 3 billion years between what was, what was present at the time versus what's left today, it seems that lots of destruction happens early once you start plate tectonics. And because this model, just to be clear, it, it has relatively little crust destruction um, early here. It's building up from zero and then it hits the higher um, destruction rates when plate tectonics starts to get going at around the late Archean. But also geodynamic uh, models of stagnant lid going to plate tectonic regimes tended, used to anyway, have big turnovers as you switch from stagnant lid to plate tectonics. And so that turnover, as predicted by those models, right, is the kind of things that Dwee Metal's model shows here. Can we see this preferential big burst of destruction in, geologi in a geological record? I'm not sure at this stage, um, but it's worth noting and seeing if we can. 
all right, change of slope of rate of growth is beginning to be some kind of global signal of the consequences of having plate tectonics, which, as I said, was the sort of third category one might look at in changing scales. These things tend to be very model dependent, but here's an intriguing one from Perrin and Marrera, and other people have done it in the rare gas world, of z using xenon isotopes. Here's uh, 128, 130, 136, 130. These are model dependent, inevitably. This is the composition of the present mantle, as best estimated. And it's widely agreed that the xenon composition of the present mantle reflects recycling of material going back into the mantle. And the question is, when did that start? And this uh, Q value is a chondritic value of the kind of composition the mantle had before recycling would have taken place. And there are different estimates of what it might be in 136, 130. And the blue line, the dashed blue line, is the evolution of the atmosphere, as sort of observed through samples through time. And clearly, if you're going to get to this point, this tiny little blue point here is the composition of the mantle by recycling material, and you're going to start with material either here or the preferred number out here, the age of the material in the atmosphere you want to recycle is 2.86 on that model. But anyway, it's late, Ar it's late Archean, all right? It's hard to do it when the stuff you would recycle would have higher 128, 130 values because it was earlier in the evolution of the atmosphere. So it's just one way to begin to think of, and there may be other models with the same data, but it's getting models thought of that might explore the consequences of plate tectonics rather than looking for other scales. And here's, here's another model which uh, people have touched on this week. So this, uh, this is the large, uh, low shear wave velocity provinces in the, in the core mantle boundary. Burke and colleagues you identified or talked about how they linked up with plumes that might be linked to flood basalts. And the question is, what is? this material, and there's lots of speculation, and we, it was a hidden reservoir briefly today, and it's been other things, and for lots of good reasons. But a graduate student, Jaron Hansmer in UWA in Perth, said, well, if it's just the, the, the accumulation of oceanic crust generated through time, we could calculate how long it would take to generate it. So this model then just assumes that this is the mass of the LSVP, which basically is this 1% velocity contour around the Burke et al. anomaly. It's very similar to all these. And that the thickness of the oceanic lithosphere and the rate you generate it and the, uh, how old it is before it starts going down and the distance it goes down is all the same as today. And if you do that and you do a Monte Carlo inversion about lots of solutions around that statement, this is the outcome you get. And the peak of these ages, if you can't read it, that's three, three billion years ago, this is uh, just over. So you get a preferred age, if you want to look at it that way, of about three billion years of processing oceanic crust of the kind we see today at the rates we see today, pile it up in the lower mantle, and you make the mass of these anomalies in three billion years. Just chance? Maybe. But it was uh, one of those nice stories where it was the first number he came up with, so he stayed with it. But it's, again, the point is to illustrate other ways to look at the, at the consequences of plate tectonics and when it may have started. So let me just then move to begin to bring some of these things together. This summarizes uh, simply on an age plot against um, a number of variables of the kind of curves we've seen. It may not be readable, but that just summarizes what we saw in the regional studies. We could look at tectonics and geochemistry. Uh, we could... Uh, begin to see things that you could establish locally and were hard to take more widely than that. And this then just summarizes some of the other conclusions. The growth curve is the Dream et al. growth curve we've just looked at with the change in slope somewhere around 3 billion. Oxygen isotopes through time, Chris uh, Spencer and a number of other people, John Valley, have plotted this through time. The green curve is the crustal thickness increase that we inferred from the RBSR variation. The red curve here, this crustal reworking curve, in a sense is 
the, the mass balance from the hafnium isotope ratios of zircons of different ages and when the proportion of reworked crust and material starts to increase compared to new crust on that mass balance. And again, this strikingly rockets up in the late Archean and stays high-ish up through here. Clearly, supercontinents, as far as we can tell, and there's movement for evidence for lateral movement from paleomag back to as far as here happened through time. And presumably, if the supercontinents are real, then you had plate tectonics to move them around. And these are the, the histogram of the zircon ages, just to show for comparison. But this becomes a time when lots of changes do seem to have occurred, which are taken together, encouraging in the sense of a, a major change in tectonic regime. They fit with other estimates, like change in rate of growth curve, like the xenon isotopes, like the mass balance for the seismic anomaly in the mantle. So this is the kind of argument we would use to say there was subduction back here. We've seen individual um, subduction zone cases made for different uh, volcanic suites. But by the time you got to here, these signals begin to imply that plate tectonics was dominant. And that we can see it through the effects, through global databases, and so on. All right, just to end then, and partly encouraged by our colleagues looking at early life and things in these areas. If we look back at early fossils, this is a stromatolite from uh, central Pilbara. Stromatolite's back 3.8, evidence for hot springs, lots of talk of nitrogen this morning and how it might uh, feed to early life. Uh, cyanobacteria responsible for great oxidation events, all these models that exist, perhaps multicellularity by 2.5 billion years. Now what interests us because we don't know enough about it probably, is what we can then use with molecular clocks. The background is simply that Bristol has a strong group in this area, in, in both uh, genomics and in um, paleontology, who use the two. So this is one of their papers that they published a year or so ago. And the question is, and what they're interested in following up, is the d extent to which these separations, if you like, or what to geologists look almost like events, which the term they would never use, could A, be firmed up on. I mean, these are very model dependent. This is a field that has a huge debate about molecular clocks and whether we should trust them or what they mean. But these people are going to go back and see whether they can establish some kind of pattern of what it might mean in terms of when these separations took place and when there were lots of them, when there were few of them. And they'd started this in their own paper with the great bombardment and the onset of plate tectonics and so on. So then what intrigues me is simply, one might begin to put these two records together, which would have the advantage, you know, the geologists are using this axis for their data, the biologists are using this axis for their data and projecting it back. If there are biases, they should be different. One bias might inform the other. But in any case, it would give us a framework whereby we might see whether the events of supercontinents and so on that we've talked about uh, might be able to be linked to uh, events in the evolution record that we may increasingly be able to tie down. And others have talked about this earlier today. So just as an area of interest where it may be possible to make some progress, I leave that with you. I think it is dead. So then, just to summarize, therefore, what we've, what we've tried to articulate is one of the challenges for geology is how we change scales from the inside of a zircon to a zircon to an orogenic system to the globe. That we can begin to do that, perhaps by emphasizing the consequences of the events we see, not the first occurrence of them. We've tried to look at the consequence of having dominance, um, plate tectonics, not the first time subduction's ever been seen. And if we combine those with uh, uh, genomics, then one will have these analyses and one will begin to see how the timing of separation in evolutionary trees may or may not link back to here as another way of taking this discussion forward. And as a final slide, let me just put this back up. So this is back on the granulite terrain in the core of that orogenic belt in the Damara. 
And it's with a sort of an acknowledgement to Steve Foley and his mind stays. He probably doesn't remember even letting this diagram out, but this is a visualization from the uh, 3.5 through to 3 billion years to 2.5, and how cratinization may have stabled up the, the continental crust. I hope I've persuaded you that there are encouraging links between the kind of magmatism you infer from geochemistry and tectonic style. There is a sort of scattered regional distribution of areas which have subduction between 3.8 and the end of the Archean. Um, in, in some cases, uh, this, in today's world, many of those are in the Northern Hemisphere. There are strong regional deformation fabrics by the end of the, Ar by the, end of the Archean, Superior Province, Yilgarn is good examples. And then the, the changes in the Archean, the late Archean, we looked at in terms of increased reworking, supercontinents, crustal thickness increasing. Uh, and, and we have highlighted the reduction in crustal growth rate encourages us to feel this was the time where plate tectonics became sustainable. Thanks for your time. This is not what it is. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, and it's uh, great that you're able to come back to provide an answer to the question that Roberta uh, kind of posed on, on Tuesday. Uh, we, we will take a couple of questions. Uh, remember that there are microphones in the various corridors. There's one up there I can see. Hi, uh, that was great. I, um, you mentioned giant dike swarms, yeah. right, dike swarms. I wanted to mention a couple things about that. Sure, there are many large ones that are back to about 2.5. We actually do have some in the earliest stabilized areas of the Pilbara and the Capfowl that are yeah. back to, in one case, 2780, the Black Range dike swarm in, in, uh, in the Pilbara, and then the Ventersdorp dikes, a radiating right. swarm in the. So, um, but that kind of is consistent with your story that you. Uh, you know that these are ice, these are areas of early stability. Right. So. Okay. Thank and I just want to yeah. mention another thing is that uh, we've known for a long time about the regional dike swarms as the plumbing system of large igneous provinces, but many of them have rate, you know, linear. Some have linear swarms. We have giant radiating swarms, and we're now discovering some giant circular swarms that are almost up to 2,000 kilometers across. Some, in some cases. So, that's an aspect related to the plume control on things through okay. time. Okay, but those are from the late Archean, I take it. Uh, well, we have radiating ones from uh, at 20, uh, 26, 6, 60, yeah. 70 in the Ventersdorp, yeah. so there is sort of a plume center story <coughs> uh, at that time, and then many of them are younger and all through time. Sure. Okay, well, thank you for that. Yep. I think there's uh, one over there. Yes. Um, that was a great talk, thank you. I have perhaps a naive question, I don't work on this. Your initial plot showed crustal thickness with some error, error bars, and then the, one of your penultimate slides showed crustal thickness without error bars. Can you tell me about the de decrease in crustal thickness in the last billion years that you showed and what that's about? Yeah. Okay, no, thanks for that. Um, we don't necessarily, the number of um, narratives you could get in reply. Uh, one of the things to, to keep in mind is that formally, those uh, rates of change of thickness are at the site at which new crust is made, all right? And you have to make, which I'm happy to do, the additional leap then from the site of new crust to representative crust. The, the, the argument about why the crustal volumes, right? Well then, okay, then the question is whether thickness equals volume, and let's say that it does. So why crustal volumes might have shrunk since uh, over the last uh, five, 600 million years. Uh, I don't think we have uh, very good information, but it may be, right, that, that this is mostly driven by the RBSR ratio of the new crust becoming more mafic in that time, and that that may or may not link to the fact that that's when, in Mike Brown's term, cold subduction would have started. So subduction development of blue schists 
became different, if you like, at about 800 million years ago. And it perhaps meant that when we got to coal subduction, we had more mafic magma added as new crust than we did before that, when paradoxically, new crust in the mid-Proterozoic was more andesitic. Not a great answer, but that's as far as we've got. Do we have another one? We have Friday beer. <laughs> Okay, well, um, uh, of course, if you do want to talk more to Chris, he will be in the Meet the Plenary yep. Room, as usual. And let's just thank uh, Chris once again.